Is your idea of hospitality a once-a-year holiday party? Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth wants to expand your horizons a little. Hospitality for the Old Testament Jews was not an event. It was a way of life. And it's intended to be a way of life for us. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Choosing Gratitude. For April 15th, 2024, I'm Dana Gresh. Hey, today is the first day of the Revive Our Hearts Spring Sale. Here's the deal. Beautiful flowers fade, clothing styles change, and trinkets collect dust. But we can bank on this. The Word of God stands forever. So check out the Spring Sale at ReviveOurHearts.com for biblically focused gifts that will leave a lasting impact on the life of your mom, your dad, a bridal couple, or a grad. For all the details, check out ReviveOurHearts.com. Now, if you approach the Old Testament stories with a 21st century mindset, you're going to miss details in those stories about hospitality. Nancy's helping us see these stories with a fresh perspective as she continues in a series called You're Welcome Here. We've been talking all this week about the ministry of hospitality and how we can reflect the hospitable heart of God by opening our hearts and our homes to other people. Now, as you get into the scripture and start to study this matter of hospitality, you see in the Old Testament many, many illustrations of hospitality. Hospitality for the Old Testament Jews was not an event. It was a way of life. And it's intended to be a way of life for us. You see, the Old Testament Jews believed that because God was their host, therefore they were obligated to show hospitality to others. We looked yesterday at the verse in Deuteronomy where it says that God loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, you are to love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, God said to his people. For those Old Testament Jews, hospitality was a sacred duty. It was unthinkable to refuse hospitality to a needy person. It was expected. It was not an option. And those who were traveling or those who were poor and needy had a right to expect that if they came to your house, they could find hospitality, that you would provide food and lodging, whatever was needed to meet your needs, and that you would also be given whatever you needed to send you on your journey. I read this past week about some of the literature of the New Testament rabbis as they spoke about hospitality, and they got this heart from the Old Testament. It was said that rabbis suggested that every household should have doors in every side of the house. And these doors were to be opened so that travelers and the poor coming from any side might have easy access. What a picture of hospitality, a door in every side of the house and the door always open so anyone could come in. It was said that one particular rabbi, Rabbi Huna, observed the custom of opening the door of his house when he was about to take his meal, saying, anyone who is hungry may come in and eat. In Jerusalem, it was said in this uh, rabbinical literature, the Jews had a custom of displaying a flag in front of the door to indicate that the meal was ready and that the guests might come in and join. They even said that you should extend your meal as long as you could so that those who were late would still have time to come and get in for the meal. And they said it was considered the duty of the host to be cheerful during the meals in order to make the guests feel at home and comfortable at the table. So you see, hospitality was a way of life for the Jews, always having an open heart, and that meant having an open home. Now, the Jews of Jesus' day thought of Abraham, their father in the faith, as the supreme model of hospitality. And so to look at an Old Testament model of hospitality, I thought it would be helpful to go back to the book of Genesis. And if you have your Bible, let me invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 18, where we see one illustration of Abraham extending hospitality. And in this passage, we get some good insights about what it means to extend Christian hospitality. Genesis chapter 18, and we're looking at the first eight verses. Now, let me say, the purpose of this passage is not primarily to teach about hospitality. God was coming to tell Abraham that Sarah was going to have a child. 90-year-old Sarah was going to have a baby, and this was God's means of getting a message to Abraham. But it's interesting how 
hospitality plays into this whole story and becomes an important part of Abraham receiving that message. Verse 1 tells us, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So Abraham is sitting here at noontime, afternoon, it's the hottest time of the day, and he's resting himself from the desert heat, and the Lord appears to him. Now we know it was the Lord because the scripture says it was, but Abraham apparently does not know at first that this is the Lord. In fact, it's interesting that the blessing Abraham received in this encounter and the revelation God gave him about what God was going to do came after Abraham extended hospitality. And I think of how, humanly speaking, Abraham could have missed the blessing God had for him if he had not opened his home, if hospitality had not been a way of life for him uh, there as he sat at his tent. It makes me wonder how many blessings does God have for us? And how many times does he want to reveal himself and his heart and his ways to us, but we miss it because our home is closed. We haven't opened our homes or our hearts. And God has blessings and rewards he wants to share with us, and we may miss it if we don't open our homes. So the Lord comes, and verse 2 says, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. Now we know as we get into the rest of the passage that one of those men was actually God himself making an Old Testament appearance. Two of the men were angels. And that's where in the New Testament we read that some have, in opening their homes to strangers, have entertained angels without realizing it. Hebrews 13 tells us this is one of those instances. But all Abraham knows is that there are three men who are passing by his tent here in the desert in the heat of the day. And when he saw them, and you get the picture here that this isn't something he stopped and thought about. He just did it spontaneously. He ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Verse 4, Please let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring you a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. Now, I see in this passage Abraham just expecting to be hospitable, assuming that he should be hospitable, not sitting here and thinking, now, do I have time today to show hospitality to these strangers? What's on my schedule today? I'm sure Abraham had things on his schedule, but whatever it was, he was flexible. He was willing to make changes in his schedule to receive these men who would come to him because he understood how important the ministry of hospitality is. We see him as a host being a humble host. He bowed himself to the ground. And in the way he addressed these strangers, he said, if I have found favor in your sight, don't pass by. He's saying, in effect, you have done me a great honor by visiting me. It's a privilege that you would come to my tent. Do you feel that way when people drop by your house unexpectedly at lunchtime or dinner time? Oh, what a blessing that you would stop by. Now, you can probably think of some people who make you feel that way, but not everyone finds that easy. And I confess that sometimes when I have my own agenda, my to-do list, my things I'm working on, my schedule mapped out for the day, it's not always easy when the phone rings and people say, we're coming through town, we'd like to see you, or the doorbell rings. Sometimes it's hard to receive guests spontaneously. Sometimes it's hard to communicate this spirit of, you're welcome here. But I see in Abraham a great example of one saying, this is an honor that you would visit me. Notice his focus as a host is on the guests, not on himself. And I think that's what is the heart of hospitality. My focus is on you, not on me, not on my house, not on all the things I haven't picked up. And I'm embarrassed that you're seeing my house as it is. But my focus is on you, making you feel comfortable, making you feel welcome. It's my joy to serve you. I sense Abraham saying that. And he extends himself in a practical way to meet their needs. He's alert and sensitive to what their needs are. It's hot. They've been traveling. He knows they're probably thirsty. He knows they're probably hungry. So he's attentive and tuned to how he can meet their practical needs. 
I've had different people stay in my home with different kinds of needs or different people come to my house. Sometimes they're hungry. They need something to eat or thirsty. Sometimes they just need a warm fire in the fireplace because it's a cold day outside and, they've, and, and their heart is cold and they need the physical and the spiritual atmosphere to warm their heart. Sometimes they just need somebody to listen. Sometimes they just need a hug, just a physical embrace to say, you are loved. Sometimes they just need a quiet place. I have guests sometimes who just need me to stay out of the way so that they can get some quiet time and just be refreshed and encouraged on their own with the Lord. Sometimes I've had a mother, a homeschool mom, call me and say, could I just come and spend a morning sitting in your house? I won't bother you. I just need a place to be quiet and to think and to pray. Say, come on over. My home is your home. Use it. Well, here Abraham sees the practical needs of his guests, and he says, let a little water be brought. Wash your feet. Rest yourselves. I'll get some bread. Refresh your hearts. You see, in extending practical hospitality, he's also ministering to their spiritual needs, to their heart needs. He's providing rest and refreshment for his guests. And then verse 6 tells us that this is not always easy. There's effort involved in extending hospitality. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Good old Sarah. Wasn't it a good thing Sarah was there? Because I don't think Abraham could have handled this on his own. He hurried to the tent to Sarah and he said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. Now that strikes me as funny when I read it. Because I can't imagine baking bread quickly. We, when we think of doing something quickly today, we don't think of baking bread. That just shows we live in a whole different concept of time than they did in those days. Grind the flour, mix it together, knead it, bake it, and do it quickly. And then verse 7 tells us, Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, one of the household helpers, and he hastened to prepare it. So he's going out, he's finding a live animal, and he's going hunting for the meal, but he's doing it quickly. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Hospitality involves work. It involves effort. It involves sharing what belongs to you, and sometimes sacrificing if you don't have a lot. And I see here that hospitality is a family effort. They were involved in this together. And we're going to talk about how your family can be involved together in the ministry of hospitality. And then we see that hospitality means the host has to have a servant's heart. Just that last little phrase. He stood by them under the tree as they ate. That was considered appropriate and polite in the Old Testament culture. As your guests were eating, you would stand by them. Why? Because you were their servant. You said, come into my home and let me serve you. So when we extend hospitality, we are showing the servant heart of Jesus. Abraham was the kind of host that I want to be. Spontaneous, flexible, open tent, open home, open heart. Come in and be refreshed. Thank you, Father, for giving us examples of what it means to be a good host. And in the model of Abraham here, we see, again, a model of your heart and how you have hastened to show mercy and grace and refreshing and kindness to us. And again, we say, help us to be hosts who have a servant's heart, to be willing to lay aside our own plans, to focus on people rather than things, to be generous and kind and sensitive, flexible and available to host others as you have hosted us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Nancy DeMoss Wagamuth has been helping all of us prepare for interruptions to our day. And maybe that interruption is exactly the meeting the Lord has ordained for you. We'd like to share with you the story of a woman who had the kind of hospitable attitude we've been hearing about. Like Abraham and Sarah, she went out of her way to show hospitality to some travelers in need. Here's one of our producers, Phil Krauss, with the story. How would you respond if your out-of-town guests, whom you thought were going to stay for just a few days, ended up staying for weeks? Well, that happened to Martha Youngaward, and it didn't faze her in the least. 
More about that in a moment. Hospitality has always been a special part of Martha's 80-year life. My parents loved having company, and my mom was the ultimate hostess. And so, I mean, I just grew up with having people in, whether it was a foreign student in town, this little old town in the middle of Minnesota, or elementary school teachers, they were always invited for supper, and school friends came for lunch. And so it was a part of my growing up. If you're looking for a good definition of hospitality, Martha would encourage you not to overthink it. You know, it says in Romans 12 to practice hospitality. So you read the Bible and you say, oh, it says I'm supposed to practice hospitality. Hmm, I wonder how you do that. Well, let me see. It's just natural part of our Christian lives. I always say people before things, and they're kind of my favorite hobby, people. That hobby came in handy over the decades. Martha served as a missionary in the country of Austria from 1972 until 2009. It was in the city of Salzburg that Martha first met Eva. I've actually known Martha since I was a teenager. And she was in the main capital in Vienna, and then she moved to Salzburg, to my hometown. And she came to our church and, and were ministering in our church. And I was at the same church as Eva and her mom and her grandma, and of course, others. She's such a lovely person, full of energy, and she can listen and remember a lot, and uh, is really attentive. And Simona came to town to study music at the Mozarteum, which is, is, is a music academy there. I met her also in the church, and she's a musician, I'm a musician, so we spoke about music, so it was my first connection at the piano. Martha moved back to the U.S. in 2009, but Eva and Simona kept in touch with her. Then in 2021, they were invited by the German Revive Our Hearts team to visit our headquarters in Michigan. Eva remembers how she felt. I was so excited for the trip. The worst of the COVID-19 pandemic was behind and international travel was opening back up. It was just um, possible to get flights to the U.S. again. And yeah, I was really excited. We talked together and we always said on the, on the flight, oh, maybe a new adventure begin. Little did Eva and Simona know what their new adventure would look like. They decided to make a stop in Minnesota first. They wanted to see Martha before they went on to visit Revive Our Hearts. And so we went to combine and said, oh, can we come to you? Yeah, and she said, yes, you're always welcome. We had a great Christmas Eve. They came on Christmas Eve day. Then we had a wonderful Christmas day together, and that was a Saturday. And Sunday we went to church. And that evening, Sunday evening, Ava started not feeling very well. I had a cold, and, and so we always said, no, it's no COVID, it's no COVID. No, it's just a little bit tired from the flight and jet lag. So the next day, Monday, Simona and I went right down to the drugstore and bought some supplies and an oximeter and some COVID strips just in case and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And sure enough, she had COVID. It was clear that it was COVID, the test was positive. We scurried around and tried to get her comfortable. Now I have a small apartment here. It's maybe 600 square feet and one bedroom and then a living room kitchen combined. So one of them was on the couch and one was on the floor on kind of a air mattress setup. And that would have been fine for one week. (laughs) Well, by Wednesday, Simona wasn't feeling well. And so she tested positive. And by Friday, yours truly, although I was trying to hide out in my bedroom and stay away from them as much as I could in a small apartment, (laughs) There we were. It was a big uncertainty. And of course, doubts came on my mind. Why here? Why, Lord? How should we handle? How should we get back? When should we get back? But in all these questions, um, we knew this is no accident and God is still in control. 
It's only a two-room apartment for us three. Martha is over 75 years old and I was anxious mm -hmm. um, because I have infected all the other two and I thought, no, please, Lord, don't, don't let it get worse and worse. One would get up and fix a little bite of something to eat and then flop back in bed. The exhaustion was the main problem. You know, you're not even able to take the dishes to the sink. You're just so exhausted to fall back in bed and sleep for 24 hours. And Martha was two days really silent and calm. That's not typical for her. <laughs> She's always she full of energy. Over. Yeah. And she was sleeping two days. And one morning I, I stood up and said, I said to her, Simona, I can't hear her anymore. And it was so terrifying for me. Mm. So, but she slept two days, that was fine. And so we could took care of her in that days. So the recipients of Martha's hospitality were now able to dispense it themselves. Simona appreciated seeing the body of Christ functioning like it should. I just felt like Martha was connected to the church. And through these connections, we were also involved in this love because they, they took care of us and they organized every little detail for us, beginning from medical care and flights and food and flowers and little surprises. One example of hospitality of my church family to us was we have a doctor in our church and their doctor in Austria was giving them prescriptions of medications, but because they were foreigners, they couldn't just take their foreign prescriptions. So we, I translated into English and gave it to Doc Erickson, and he went down, gave us a prescription, and we went to the pharmacy and got their things in a roundabout way. But that was another example of how God uses us with each other in times of need and hospitality, you know. The visit that was supposed to last only a few days stretched into five weeks due to quarantine restrictions. All three of them had to test negative for a full two weeks before they could get back on an airplane. And while Ava and Simona's visit to Revive Our Hearts is yet future, they still see God's hand in their trial. Well, I can say if you go through hard times with your friend, it will deepen your relationship. So it was a hard time for us, but the memory is sweet. Like sweet and it's nice. And we are somewhere else uh, in the connections to Martha and also to this church and, and also to the Lord, I can say. Yeah, it was grace. All of the Lord, Lord's grace. I really like Ecclesiastes 11.6. Sow your seed in the morning, and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. So to me, hospitality is sowing seed. We sow the seed of God's Word, and we so his loving kindness to others around us, and whether it's my neighbors down the hall or whether it's somebody from far away like Ava and Simona, and whether it's morning or evening, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes a knock comes on the door at six o'clock in the evening, and I'm kind of tired and, oh, well, Debbie's here, so, oh, come on in, have a bite of supper, because I'm just fixing supper. And it's any time of day or night, we should be ready to share our lives with others. Ah, oh, what an amazing picture of hospitality. We've been hearing from Ava Wenzel and Simona Golova. They're connected with the Revive Our Hearts German team, and we've heard from the woman who hosted them when they were in need, Martha Youngelord. The Lord may have some divine appointments for you. Will you be ready? We'd like to help you get ready and help you gain even more of a heart of hospitality. So we'd like to send you a new study from Revive Our Hearts. It's called You're Welcome Here. As you open God's Word, you'll learn that hospitality isn't about cultivating the perfect surroundings, cuisine, and company. It's a way to live in full surrender to Jesus. 
The study is perfect for personal or group study. You can even access some wonderful video content from Aaron Davis and others to accompany each week's lesson. We'll send you a copy of your welcome here when you give a gift of any amount to Revive Our Hearts this month. It's our way of saying thank you for your support of our mission, helping women thrive in Christ. To make a donation, just visit reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. Again, it's reviveourhearts.com or 1-800-569-5959. So Jesus was always giving to others. He healed, he taught, and he cooked. Hmm, wouldn't it be incredible to eat a meal that had been prepared by Jesus? We'll look at his hospitality tomorrow. Please be back for Revive Our Hearts. This program is a listener-supported production of Revive Our Hearts in Niles, Michigan, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.